Uniat Amerika, pusat kebudayaan pertama Amerika di dunia menggunakan high technology. Amerika tahu sih sedikit. Suatu negara besar lah ya. Kebebasan berpendapat ya. Seni musik, kayak yang lain-lain. Hi, I'm Michael Jones. I'm Google's Chief Technology Advocate. I'm one of the founders and creators of Google Earth, and I'm so excited to be here at America to see Google Earth and all other American technologies on display. People can see how technology can really take a transformative role in the lives of people all around the planet, especially here in Jakarta and all the rest of Indonesia. Di sini saya mendapatkan berbagai informasi mengenai pendidikan yang ada di Amerika. Setelah adanya Et Amerika ini, saya jadi lebih tahu seluk beluk kehidupan Muslim di Amerika tuh kayak gimana. Saya bisa nonton konser musisi Amerika dan dalam negeri secara gratis. Pokoknya asik dia di sini. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Air America. For those who have never been here before, Air America is the American Center here in Jakarta. My name is Dina. I'm one of the e-guide here, and I will be more than happy to answer all of your questions regarding Air America. And now I would like to give you a glimpse of our upcoming events. So for our next event, we will have a film screening and also discussion. We will screen two films on Broadway, and also The Flanners. It will also be followed by a discussion with Putut, a film producer, and also Aryo, a film director. So please come and join us on Friday, June 21st, starting from 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. And next, we will also have a presentation, Understanding the U.S. University and Community College Systems. So for those of you who wants to pursue a higher degree in the United States, you don't want to miss this event. Please come and join us on Saturday, June 22nd, starting from 2 until 3.30 p.m. And we will also have a presentation, Wisely Digital Speaker Series, Building Sustainable Communities. We will discuss about community outreach with Michael Scott Peters, a U.S. Youth Observer to the United Nations. So please come and join us on Thursday, June 27, starting from 6.30 until 8.30 p.m. And of course, every event in at, in at America is for free. And also, we have Education USA. So for those of you who want to pursue a higher education in the United States, we have two advisors standing by starting from Monday until Sunday to answer all of your questions regarding education in the United States. We are here every day starting from 1 p.m. until 9 p.m. daily. And on Saturdays, we are here a little bit earlier starting from 10 a.m. And these are the highlights of our past events. And how to stay updated to our events, simply visit our website at www.adamerica.or.id. Click register, enter your name and email address, and you will be officially our member. And the benefit is you will get newsletter just once a week through your email about our upcoming event. 
And of course, we are also very active with our social media. We have Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, Stellar, and also YouTube channel. And for those of you who still like to tweet, please help spread the love by tweeting to us to add at America. And don't forget to use the hashtag at America. And your tweet will appear on our live tweet wall on my left side. And also for today's event, we have a special hashtag, hashtag Indonesia USA 70TH. So for those of you who wants to tweet, please use the hashtag and mention us at, at America. And to begin today's event, please give a warm welcome to Mr. Jed T. Dornberg, the Ad America Director. Selamat siang. Yeah. Selamat datang di America. Welcome to Ad America. We're very happy to have you here today. I am very delighted uh, today to be welcoming uh, the Assistant Secretary uh, Marie Royce um, to speak with you today. Uh, Marie, uh, Secretary, Se Assistant Secretary Royce was sworn in on March 2018 as the Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of Education and Cultural Affairs. Um, from there, she oversees a wide variety of programming on education, professional programs, cultural programs, and athletic programs, to name just a few. Um, from there, they develop mutual understanding and networks between the citizens of the United States and citizens from countries all over the world. Um, the Bureau of Education Cultural Affairs was founded in 1961. And it plays an essential role in promoting international development and understanding between our countries, building us all stronger together. So without much more ado, I welcome Assistant Secretary Marie Royce. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Selamat siang. Thank you. How are you? So great to see everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So this is my second trip to Jakarta. And the first time I've been uh, to Jakarta in my position as Assistant Secretary of State for Educational and Cultural Affairs. Now I want to ask you, how many of you are having their first time at Ad America? Can you please raise your hands? First times. Let's give yourselves a round of applause. Yes. And, and, and for those that have been here before, please raise your hand. We want to applaud you as well because we appreciate you coming to visit us. Thank you. I wanted to let you know that this is a very exciting year for the United States and Indonesia. Uh, I'm wearing a special pin, which has our two flags on it. And the reason I'm wearing this pin is it's all about this special bilateral relationship between our two countries, US and Indonesia. Our friendship begins 70 years ago, so it's such an honor to be able to be here today to help celebrate that. And I also was excited to see about all the hashtags. I love you to stay connected with me. I have a one on Twitter. It's ECA underscore AS because I'm the assistant secretary. I also have a Facebook page. And I'd also add, since you all seem very active here, if you have things that you're interested in, please let me know through uh, the contacts at the embassy because we would be very interested in ensuring you have great speakers, continued great films, or anything that you're interested, please let me know. But I also want to share with you that I also used to teach at a university in Southern California. I taught international business. And I had many Indonesian students. And they were uh, just so terrific. And through those students, I learned so much about Indonesia. And they added so much to my classes, helping all the other students learn more about, the United, about their country. And then, of course, uh, you learn more about the United States. So I'd like to say at this time, what was shared earlier, the importance of the fact that we've got the advising center here for EdUSA. It's really nice, it's in the back, and I'd really recommend that you go to the, the college night and you also go to EdUSA to learn more about opportunities. In the United States, a lot of students say to us, you know, and my students told me that, they said, it's not that easy, it's kind of expensive sometimes, the high cost of education. So what we're really promoting is what we call the two plus two model. Do you know, anybody want to guess what the two plus two is? It's community college and a university. So two different schools. If you go to the community college, 
The nice thing about that, it's, it's less expensive. And for people that maybe their English skills is not as good, you can improve your English. And then you can live in one place in the United States and then come to a second place, if you'd like, and go to a university where it's a little bit more rigorous and graduate. That's a model that many Americans use. In fact, my father actually went to a community college and then he graduated from a university. So I just want to recommend that. Also to say that there's a right school for every person here. If you're thinking about going to the United States to study, we have 4,700 community colleges and universities in the United States. So I just want you to really think about that and spend some time thinking about, do you want to be in the arts, entrepreneurship, STEM, business, every public administration, we have, it, have exactly the program that's right for you. So with that, I'd also like to say that we have 9,000 Indonesian students currently in the United States. And then lastly, I'll just share that there's other ways to experience the United States. We have a program called Exchange Visitor Program. So if you ever want to think about, let's say, working in the United States in the summer, you can do, they, they require a little bit of community service, but you can work in the summer and, and, and the embassy can teach you about that. You may pay a small fee to a sponsor, but then you're allowed to make money and experience part of the US. So I'd like to warmly welcome you and encourage you to do that. So just to end with my remarks here, I just would like to say how much I appreciate being warmly welcomed here in Indonesia. I really appreciate all the hospitality that I've been shown. And I just want to say how appreciative I am of the fact that we've had this very important relationship between our two countries for 70 years. And again, thank you for welcoming me here today. Thank you. And to begin today's discussion, I would like to invite our moderator today, Alin Wiratmaja, news anchor of CNBC Indonesia. Thank you. Thank you, Dina. Thank you so much for coming to Ad America. We're going to have amazing, amazing discussions today about leadership, a conversation on women's empowerment. I've been informed that we have a lot of students from different universities around Jakarta and I would like to welcome you one by one from, I would like to hear the students from Universitas Indra Prasta PGRI, Unindra. Woo! Thank you for coming. And we have also students from University of Indonesia, UI. And students from ISIP, and welcome for students from University Islam Negeri Syarif Hidayatullah, UIN. And also students from Universitas Nasional, UNAS. Thank you so much for coming. Our event today is being live streamed on our social media platform at AT America. And please, uh, you can share your experience here. And then remember the hashtag that mentioned before by Dina. And now I would like to invite to the stage our five amazing panelists today from the USA Assistant Secretary of State for Educational and Cultural Affairs. Please once again, big applause for <laughs> Assistant Secretary Royce. Yes. And I would also like to invite Caroline Casagrande, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Academic Programs. Please uh, take the beetle seat. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Caroline. And I would also like to welcome to the stage Rosita Tandos, Executive Director of Bakis Foundation Indonesia. And also Francisca Utami, co-owner and also co-founder of Clevio Coder Cam. Please welcome her as well. And last but not least, Christina Surya Jaya, co-founder and also chief strategy officer of 
Travelio. So today we have uh, 40 minutes for the discussion and then 20 minutes for the Q&A. You can, uh, like, if you have question, you can also share your question on our social media, of course. And I would like to start with uh, Assistant Secretary uh, Mary Royce to share her journey as a woman leader. Is this, can everyone hear me? Yes. All right, well, thank you so much for that question. It's Juanita, correct? Yes, just call um, me Aline. I just want to say that uh, I started as a leader in high school and grade school. So, and I was a leader in college. Uh, so I think that when I was thinking about uh, when I started as a, a leader, and the other thing is I didn't necessarily think of myself as a woman leader, I just thought of myself as a leader. So I think that's very important. When there's an opportunity that you want to be part of something, I think you should raise your hand and when I started in college, I remember I was uh, a sophomore in college, and there was a, uh, a, a club I joined, and somebody was running in the club. He was a senior in college. And what happened was he, um, everybody said the senior, he's a male senior, he's going to get this position. But to me, I decided I felt I was the most qualified from my leadership experience, and I, and I ended up winning and running. And I think part of it is that you also will not always win everything you try to uh, go after, but I think you shouldn't be afraid to fail. But I think well, the other key thing is I think you should try. Um, one of the reasons leadership is important is because you get to be helping to make decisions, helping to build the team, and, and it's very important. And then I took on leadership roles in uh, different positions when I went into business. Uh, I worked for major multinational companies and I was a manager, and then I became an executive. So I would just say that um, the other, lastly, I would say that I also studied it in school. I was a business major, so I learned leadership and management. So that was also very helpful. What are the challenges that you have to overcome to achieve success as a leader? Well, I would just say uh, a challenge is that uh, sometimes, uh, you, you, I would just say you have to have a strong vision and you have to be very fo focused. Uh, the other thing you have to do as a leader is you need to be a very good listener, ensuring that you get, you get everyone in the team involved. Uh, sometimes it's faster as a leader to get things done by just doing it by yourself, but that's not leadership. Because what, let's pretend I left and I said I'm quitting tomorrow and no one's behind me to, that knows how to do it. They don't have the skills. That's not leadership. What leadership is, is trying to get everybody involved and helping them grow so that they could also do, um, uh, run the organization or build the team. And it takes longer to do that, but that's really what leadership is. Okay, now I would like to hear from uh, Rosita Tandos. Please share your experience and your journey as a leader. Thank you. I think I have a video to play on. Excuse me. Um, yeah, this is. Uh, I will start my presentations. Uh, so currently, I uh, have some positions uh, as, as ex executive director of Balkis Foundations, and I'm teaching at Sarif, uh, State Islamic University of Sharif Hidayatullah, and a head of associations of community development education professions. Then uh, also the leader of a community economic empowerment program, and then also work at the two ministry as team ex expert team for the minister. The next, my, I would like to share to, uh, my experience studying in New York. In New York, actually, a school of social welfare in Albany is quite amazing, incredible. There, I can, I really focus on and I really timetable on doing something and really tar on target in doing something. So I share to all of my uh, students here: you should be encouraged to go to US. Okay. Next, uh, yeah, you can give a applause. You, we, we become a new person, I say, because there are very uh, punctuations there. You should you not know, target in doing something. And this is part of my activities now. I am involved in some organizations at nationals. I, I always become the only woman in organization, but it's fine. It's quite a bit challenge, but I enjoy it. And that's already Umar office. And then also in imam organizations, I'm the only woman there. Uh, handle for the women issue. 
And then previously I got a head of gender and uh, children's studies in my university. And this is also I, the second time I come to at America as a part of my social activity. And then this is the association I lead now. It's actually the members is from University of Islamic Higher Education under the Ministry of Religious Affairs, uh, especially for community development studies. So, yeah, again, as a leader, the challenge, you should enjoy the challenge. It's not easy to be in Jakarta and you should manage all over Indonesia. So this is another activity in international level. Uh, the, the, the reason one is community uh, no, no, women economic empowerment in Taipei is then nominated by U.S. Embassy. Thank you so much to always nominate me uh, almost every year after my graduations. And then this is my participation in women in preventing PVA, CVA, and gender equality and human rights. Now all over the issue about women, I enjoy so much how we as a woman uh, should be a leader, should be an agent of change. Don't be afraid to be alone to be the only woman in the team or organizations. So this is the, uh, also another opportunity to join law leadership and uh, 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 conflict resolutions, also a uh, human uh, nominated by US Embassy. This is my current work, Community Economy Empowerment. The project is started on, in 2015 to empower return female migrant domestic workers in Indramayu. The place is well known as the main source of uh, the workers. And then start with my research, actually my dissertation in US, and then develop a program as uh, an action for my research. So this, the, uh, the, the program is mainly to uh, training for entrepreneurship and then also uh, distributing microcredits. And then now involved by 700 of women. And then I'm so happy with their uh, development as this program is sustainable until now with it, without any new funding. So they themselves empower themselves. This is also the program for children. And then we run the training in open space. Everybody can stop by, join the training. So yeah, it's, it's welcome for everybody. So this is the micro credits. And I say 100% of the fund is re paid on time. And then we re redistribute it in the next round. Now already in 10 rounds for until last March 2019. This is the visiting from US Embassy. Uh, previously, they visit the women's business there. We share and meet the, with the women. And it's quite amazing to have a US uh, Embassy representative to, to do very remote area there in Indramayu. This is how women also turn it to make a beauty salon, to make a batik, traditional clothes of, Ind of Indonesia, and a also other things, not only to make a um, business product like food, but also to give skills to the women. Next. The, you can see the business and the product. So you can imagine that it's a big business. It's a very local business. So these women just go around the village to, to sell uh, food in the morning. It's, this is also the same. And then this is, they, they go around the village and neighbors to sell the vegetables. And then this is for chicken porridge. And another one is uh, they have a small shop. And then they very uh, empower one another. And then this is the, ma the husband help the woman to, to produce the, the business product. And then what is uh, very amazing from this uh, pro work with the women, because they get uh, uh, support from their family. This is quite a sophisticated one. You can see this is like a bakery in Jakarta, right? They can produce this such a standard of product. And then they, they sell it not only inside the village, but also online. And even they can uh, import, export to other countries like uh, uh, Quakering and etc. So we can see that the woman, the, the most important thing is to, to, to give information to the woman. There is a way, an alternative for them to develop their capacity. So they, they don't just go overseas to work domestically, but they can stay at home with their families and still support financially to their uh, families. That's the most important thing of this program. So this is the program uh, we've done. Okay, to, uh, and then what, what made me proud now, since the last two years, the train is not only from the, the business uh, um, person, but now from the women themselves. 
the day they can uh, become role model from the other, especially, especially for the new members, then they can show that they, they can survive with their, with their small business. So you can see also their product is, is nice, actually. I don't know the, about the picture, but you can see the, the, the quality is also sell in a shop like in Jakarta. So this is Batik. We have Batik, uh, uh, Batik School, Sekolah Batik. And this is the last, another output of the program. I write a book about community economic development, describing about the methods, new model of community development, and how I work with the women for almost four years now. So yeah, it's incredible to be a part of women and a proud as a woman, of, of course. And then this is another uh, point from me that empowering me, women as an agent of chain, expert and partner of men, it should be have a channel for the, uh, to talk about women's rights, to give more space about women's rights. Like uh, assistant, secretary say, we, we should get information, build, develop their knowledge and other resources available in our community. And also to develop women's leadership, not, not from their individual, but also to their uh, family, their, to their group, community, and organizations, if they are working in organization. And also to ensure that there is women's participation in all aspects of life, like a social, like economic, and political life. Because I see, uh, as, long as, uh, as far as I'm studying about women issue in Indonesia, as politicals at the level of policy should be really, really addressed because it, it will deal with the, not just about policy, but also program and services available for the women. Thank you. I think that's all. And then, yeah. And you can visit us at Balkis Foundation Indonesia, our website, and I'm very happy to uh, answer all the questions for the next. Thank you so much. Yay, amazing. Empowering women, empowering the community, definitely. And I, um, I also being informed that we also have attendees or guests from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia. Please welcome them. Thank you so much for joining us. Now I would like to hear the story from Caroline Casagran, your journey as a leader. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. I feel like I'm on a talk show right now, <laughs> which is super cool. And I'm from New Jersey in the States. Do you guys know New Jersey? It's right outside New York. The Sopranos, Bon Jovi. Um, anyway, New Jersey loves malls. So I consider myself a connoisseur of malls. And this is a fantastic mall. So I can see why you're all here. It's a wonderful, wonderful spot. Um, Thanks for having us. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming to talk to us. I know we've got a lot of men and women in the audience, so I want to talk to both of you. Um, and so I guess the question is leadership and, and the things I've learned about leadership in my life. Um, so I'm going to say the first important thing I learned about leadership, and this isn't just because I'm the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Bureau in the State Department that's tagline is, we move people to move ideas, which is what we do. Um, but one of the things I think that can really make you a leader is when you're your age, when you're young and your world's ahead of you and you still have time to make a lot of decisions, do something that scares you. Take a risk. Um, when I was 20, I decided I wanted to work for the youngest democracy in the world, which at the time was South Africa. And I knew my parents would never ever in a million years sign off on their, on their daughter going to Africa by herself. Um, but that didn't stop me from applying and using my own money and getting into the program. And eventually, um, through a lot of tears and anger, my parents let me go. Um, I still remember one of my favorite memories. I can close my eyes and see my mother cooking over the stove, wearing sunglasses to kind of hide her tears as they were just coming down. Um, she was just convinced it was going to be the end of me. But through that experience, I went and, and I worked in the newest democracy in the world. I had a front row seat to a government being formed after years of apartheid and, and oppression. And I thought of myself differently after that year. You know, I thought I was no longer this girl from Jersey who studied political science. I was a brave international woman capable of working in international government. And that came from taking that risk 
which now that I'm old, I'm like, wow, I hope none of my children try to go somewhere dangerous when they're 20. But, but, but it, changed, it changed the way I, I thought of myself. And so that's my first piece of advice to you. Do something that scares you when you're young. And, and you're braver than you think you are, I promise. Um, the second piece of advice, and, and this probably leads into the second thing, um, when I was uh, 29, I became the youngest representative that's a woman ever in the state of New Jersey. I represented 220,000 people. And I, yeah, it's pretty cool, right? I still have that title. Uh, and, and some people say, well, how did that happen? How'd you, how'd, you get that, how'd you get there so young? Well, the reality is everybody told me that I was on a suicide mission, right? Everyone said, oh, your opponent has $2 million, which they did. You have 400,000, and by the way, this district is Democrats, and you're a Republican. You're never going to do it. But you know what? I thought, okay, that's all right. Even if I don't do it, I'll at least have tried, and I'll give it my best shot, right? So at the time, I was a practicing attorney. Um, I still am an attorney. I just do something different right now. And every day after I was done with my briefs, I'd put on my sneakers, and I'd knock on doors. And I knocked on 10,000 doors, um, which was wild. But through that experience, I somehow eked out a small, small win in that election and became the youngest woman ever elected. But my point to that story is um, no one invited me to that experience. No one knocked on my door and said, hey, Carolyn Casgrin, 29-year-old municipal attorney, we want you to run for office. Um, I stood up and I said, I want to do this. Um, and that brings me to one of the greatest pieces of advice I've ever heard, um, particularly about leadership. Um, which is, and this is kind of an American phrase, but I think you'll get it. If you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So if you're not at that seat of power, if somebody who looks like you, sounds like you, is kind of close to your age, um, isn't part of that discussion, then people are probably making decisions about you without any representation that looks like you there. Um, so it's important that we have diversity in our legislatures. It's important that we have diversity in our leadership and the age range. And so I encourage you to think, um, why not you? Because no one's going to invite you. However, right now, I'd like to take a moment and invite all the women to run for office. Um, I did teach uh, for a little while at Rutgers, and I taught women in government. And one of the statistical things about women in government is that most women have to be invited to run. Um, guys have a tendency to stand up and say, yeah, I'm going to be awesome at that. Um, but women, you kind of have to egg along. I know that's shocking, knowing men and women, but it's true. I'm just kidding. Of course, men are like, yeah, I'd be awesome at that. Um, but, but so you have, to, you have to really, you know, be brave. And then my third piece of advice, and this one's also really important, and this is just life advice, and it's for the guys and the ladies, um, and that is choose a partner that's the nicest person you know. Um, I have three children, right? And look at me in Indonesia this week. And my husband's a very successful man, and he's with our three children this week, balancing work and childcare and everything else. Um, but that's because he supports me and I support him. And we make our family work together, um, and we're a team. And so I always am very grateful that, that, you know, I found a partner that would support me and I can support him and we can be that team together. Um, so if you are gonna get married, um, find someone really, really nice to marry. Um, and those are my three pieces of advice. Whoa, very, very wonderful advice. <laughs> we should write it down. And then how about you, um, Francisca Utami? Do you do this like you be at the challenge and do something that really scare you when you establish uh, your coder camp? When, yeah, when we started quarter cam, it's actually, it's more like a, because it started out as a need for my own son. So it's kind of like, okay, this is something that we need, but then nobody has, uh, has provided that uh, at that time. Yeah, this is six years ago. So we just sort of, okay, let's look into this. Um, I think when we, when we make our mission personal to us, uh, we don't really think about so much about how or what people is going to say and things like that, which is a lot of times that's the fear when we're, as, a, as women, especially in this country, being a leader, we fear so much about what people will think, about the expectations, about the, uh, a lot of things that people, uh, how, how people, how the society will see us. Uh, so that's, uh, but when, when we think about um, uh, doing something in a personal way. We don't worry about so much about that because especially for me, 
uh, the journey starts really uh, a long time ago. Um, I, I was born and raised in Papua, so uh, that's me in Jayawijaya Mountain. <laughs> uh, that's in what, 1991, and then one year later, I was in Vermont. Um, so far away. So yeah, I, I can relate so much to Caroline's story. When somebody asked me, um, do you want to go to the US to study? And then I said, yeah, I think so. And then I have no idea how I can communicate with my parents. We didn't have this. Yeah, this is, you know, for you guys are lucky being away from parents and can communicate. We, I, I couldn't, you know, it's a once a month thing. So, um, but I, you know, I began my journey. 11 years, uh, I live uh, in the US and I studied in high school. Uh, I studied in college and then um, I work and then got married and then studied some more. <laughs> so um, I don't have a lot of pictures. So, because back then we didn't have digital cameras. Yeah, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but this is pretty much what I did. I explore. This is, that's the time when I explore a lot of things. Um, I went into math leagues. I went into Big Brother, Big Sister program. I became camp. Uh, uh, I volunteered as camp counselors, and then uh, I joined the Society of Women Engineer uh, because I studied uh, environmental engineering back then. I was also the international club president, uh, which is really fun because I get to meet a lot of people like me. <laughs> and then, uh, and when I finally graduated um, in 1999, so the the whole theme is about self exploration for me. Uh, that's what I get a lot of, uh, the, I think, the biggest value of being in the U.S. Uh, at that age, being alone far away from my family, was that I get to explore myself, what I want to do. And then um, another phase is uh, because I, I, I got married and stuff, I uh, have kids, and then I start volunteering a lot. Uh, Ashoka Changemaker has been one of my inspiration. Uh, I volunteered for them, and then uh, it kind of... Uh, push me into um, my interest into community development, uh, just like Ibu Rosita here. And then I started a program uh, in El Cajon, uh, San Diego, south in Southern California, called International Women's Kitchen, which is a, a program to empower uh, women from um, uh, refugee women to to start a business, basically. Um, and then later on. So this is, you know, it's okay to change. I, I was in, I was in engineering first, and into community development, and then I started um, to be counselor in uh, psychology <laughs> in Singapore. So a lot of times, I just, you know, um, to me, be, uh, especially because I start uh, having family pretty young, and then I, um, I don't have a lot of ambition to do something. But then every time there's an opportunity to discover something, to learn something, to volunteer, to put myself out there, I did that. Um, Read San Diego, also one of the programs that actually inspired me to, uh, or actually tickled my passion in education. So and then I realized, hey, you know, when I think about education, my heart starts beating a little faster, and I want to do something about that. So, um, and then uh, after that, uh, about six years ago, uh, again, uh, it's a combination of my passion in education and then the need of my own son to learn coding at the time. And then we started a company with a, um, with a motto, uh, with a value of, uh, of uh, clever, leverage, human-centric, and greater good uh, that we call Clevio. Clevio stands for clever input-output. So whatever we do, it has to be clever and human-centric and has to be for the greater good. So we started this program that we called Clevio Coder Camp, in which we, uh, our, our mission is how we can uh, leverage uh, the people in Indonesia using technology, uh, but, not, uh, but not make technology itself as a, uh, to, be, to be the purpose, to be the goal, but instead to use technology to leverage them. Uh, and, in, and in this case, by learning coding, Kids can learn to produce something, to be, uh, to be, uh, to create something that is useful for others. Yeah, because we all know that not all programmers are good people. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of like you know those who make, uh, who 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 hack into banks, who hack into people's emails and stuff like that. We know that. So 
we want to start early from them to, to know how to use this knowledge, to use this skill in a positive way. And then we also use, uh, we create a learning system in which they learn how to develop social skills, to develop their characters. And then at the end, they become technopreneurs. So that's the goal. Uh, that's the, the four benefits that we want to achieve uh, in Clevio Coder Camp. Uh, and I guess through this, and really, again, I don't, I'm not, uh, I, I've never think myself as a leader, but then because we started this uh, in a way that we want to do it well, we, we don't want to just make a coding school. So we ended up become the leader in this industry. We become the leader in this field uh, in which we use technology and education as a, as a way to develop, uh, to empower kids and especially women. And then also uh, people with disabilities, which is still, um, uh, something that's really new in here. We started out uh, just be, by being brave, by trying to teach uh, kids with autism uh, to learn coding. Um, and then I, I got really inspired by the women uh, in, um, uh, when, we, when I was sent by the uh, Swedish government to join the Women in Tech conference a couple of years ago in Stockholm. And I saw that how many uh, women are there that are just very comfortable being in that you know, uh, being in that area, being the leader, being the people who, who, uh, who, who are, um, I guess, with a lot of people who, who are looking at them in awe, but then they're so comfortable with that, you know, and well, meanwhile, here, we're still kind of scared in doing something like that, yeah. So, um, for me, I guess I uh, started out with self-exploration, and then by, after knowing what I want, I just move forward with what I want to what I want to achieve um, so I think that's it pretty much uh, my my mission here is to educate to inspire others and to empower others as important and now I think uh, to the youngest panelists among us all on the stage here Christina Suryajaya can you share uh, your journey as co-founder of Travelio so if I were to just rewind back to um, the, top, the topic about leadership, so my first source of leadership came about um, through my passion. So when I was in middle school and high school, I was passionate about sports. Um, I represented Singapore for three years in netball and one year in soccer. Um, and it was also a passion that turned into a career because every hour that I turn up for training, I would get paid $10. So I would always save my money and put it in the bank. And that's the safest way to save your money, right? So after that, I decided to pursue higher education because um, I thought, I mean, I thought that, you know, in the future you have to be financially responsible and stuff like that. So I went to University of Southern California in Los Angeles and I majored in business. And then I continued to go to uh, Cornell University in their hospitality management program. So the first challenge that exposed me was in Cornell University. I took a class in entrepreneurial finance and it was heavy, it was very difficult. It was all about the topic of you know, financing, how to do angel investing, which is individual investing, how to gain venture capital financing, how to do you know, IPOs and all this stuff. And I remember the professor saying, I know this stuff is heavy. You know, a lot of you wanna be entrepreneurs or wanna be entrepreneurs. And I guess in my class, none of you will ever obtain venture capital financing. And in my head, I'm like, why? <laughs> well, there's so many people graduating every year. Why does this professor keep repeating the fact that none of us can ever get venture capital financing? So that was the first challenge that uh, stuck into my head. Uh, but then I continued to, after school, I continued to work. Um, and I got into the banking and uh, management consulting industry, which is what the traditional Asian parents would like us to do. But then I went off track. I got accepted from an intercontinental hotels group in Singapore, which is a hospitality uh, hotel chain. And I took that uh, opportunity because um, in a contract, I saw that in one year, you'll become a manager. So I'm like, oh, okay, I'm a 22 year old and in one year I can manage a lot of people. That's pretty cool to me. <laughs> so yeah, I took that job and I got a bit uh, bored because um, I found out that, you know, working as a professional life, you get told what to do. Like, here's your target and here's the way to achieve your target. And I didn't really like that. I like having targets, but I like to do it my own way. So it didn't really match with me. And at that time, um, I was bouncing off ideas with my friends from uh, Cornell alumni and other friends from uh, my two co-founders of Travelio from uh, Purdue University and Curtin University. 
and uh, we established Travelio, which is a property management firm in uh, Indonesia. So more like Airbnb, but medium to long term. So it's um, for rentals, uh, property rentals for monthly and yearly rentals. Um, and we started it uh, in 2015. Uh, the growth was good. We, we, we used our own capital. So I used all my life savings from sports uh, into Travelio, which is maybe not very smart, but very risky. Um, as well, but um, the company wasn't doing well for the first two years. We almost went bankrupt uh, because the model was more like um, a bidding, like a price line model in the United States where you just bid for the hotels, villas, apartments, and there's so many rivals here. You have like Agoda, you have Traveloka and stuff. It wasn't sustainable. So we pivoted into more of an Airbnb-like model where we manage um, high-rise uh, residential, residential apartment buildings. And at that time, I was also applying um, for a competition at the Next Gen uh, World Entrepreneur of the Year in Monaco in 2016. Um, yeah, it was a very long application. Um, I, I didn't win in the end, but I applied again in 2017. And historically, uh, the winners for that uh, for the award was always somebody from the Western Hemisphere. It was never somebody from the, the from Asia. But when I applied in 2017, uh, shockingly enough, I was the first Indonesian to uh, receive the awards at the World Entrepreneur of the Year in Monaco. And it was very nerve wracking because you have to present in front of um, people like uh, William Lauder of SE Lauder, Justin Rockefeller and all these venture capital firms. So it was very nerve wracking, but um, it was also a great opportunity to, net to network and talk to them. And at the event as well, and through the um, Cornell alumni uh, relations. I also got to meet uh, the CEO of Hyatt, the CEO of Marriott, and all the uh, founders of hotel chains as well. And they're very willing to come up to you. Um, uh, but the beginning was in the beginning, it was um, because I name dropped Cornell. So, you know, oh, okay, alumni, or they donated a building or something like that, something in common. And they're actually really pleased to to talk to you. So don't be afraid of talking to them. And I guess the challenge um, I have right now is that we started off with four people, and now um, we have a team of 250 at Travelio right now. And, <laughs> and we've received four, four rounds of venture capital financing from uh, venture capitalists in the United States, China, Malaysia, Singapore, and Indonesia as well. And the challenge is that at every stage of financing, you have to change your role as a leader. So at the first stage, you have to prove to your employees, because at that time, I was the youngest out of all the employees, I was 22, that you can actually work. So I, when I first started, I was a social media manager and a marketing manager, I had to show the employees that I can do whatever they do, and then they can, I can earn my respect. And at every round, you have to always let go of your, you have to delegate. And that's a hard part that uh, I'm facing right now because we have 250 people and we're um, employing vice presidents and you know, middle le level management. And you just have to know which parts uh, you have to let go and which part you have to stick to and have everyone aligned to uh, the same vision that you have. Oh, impressive. <laughs> and now we're about to discuss about how importance and the role of education for life and for leadership, for career, what do you think about it? Well, thank you for asking. Um, I think education is very important. Um, I think that also it gives you a lot of discipline uh, for uh, the future. Uh, when you take the different classes uh, on a schedule and you um, are going to have to really get to know the subjects and sometimes you're also going to be taking subjects that you might not be interested in when you get your degree. Um, but that's actually very important, too, because you have to um, have discipline, and a lot of times those subjects are actually going to be very helpful. I'll just share the fact that was, when I was teaching at Cal Poly Pomona, the university, I taught a class that was very difficult. It, had, it was a financial class. The students didn't like the, the class at all. Um, of all the classes I taught, that's the one class that I, I didn't get the highest you know, marks. The students give you... But did you know that every senior, when they were graduating, came back to me? Once they graduated and they said, Professor Royce, we're so happy you taught us that class because we now realize that was a class we really needed to be successful. So what I want to tell you is when you actually are taking a lot of these classes, um, it's very important a lot of times for you to be successful in the future. Um, and as far as education is concerned, um, I just think it's a, the cornerstone for everything you do um, in your future. Um, in addition, like I, I mentioned about, um, you get the life skills. You also get time management. You get to learn how to work with teams. You also uh, get to stand in front of the, the, um, 
the classmates, actually, and, and get a chance to speak. So I would just say that um, education is key for people. Um, and I think what's nice about being in the uh, university is to actually um, take classes you might not take. I took, even as a professor, I actually even took classes because I wanted to learn new skills. Um, my whole life, I've been what they call a learner, a person that likes learning. I didn't share with you that I've actually changed industries uh, three, several times. Now I work in the government, but I used to work in the private sector. I started off in a consumer products company. I worked for Procter & Gamble for 10 years. I worked in sales management for eight. I decided to go into research and development, working with scientists and engineers. Then I went into the hospitality business. I went to Marriott Corporation. Uh, I had never done that before. And then I went into teaching, never had done that before. Uh, then I went into technology. Um, and people were saying, I can't believe you're going into telecommunications, where I work with scientists and engineers again. Uh, I had to learn it from scratch. Uh, so what I would just say was I have never was afraid to learn and ask questions and try to uh, figure out how things worked. And I think that's really important. A lifelong learner, definitely. How about you, Rosita Tandos? How important is education for you and for women? Okay. Um, I think it's very important. I will start with myself. Uh, when I pursue my PhD uh, in U.S. under Fulbright Scholarship, uh, for three years, and I should come back for my dissertation from Indonesia and still doing my dissertation and come back for work. I saw that the people address me differently when they hear about American because they know the standard education there. And then it's, and then it's become more and more uh, open op opportunity for me when I finish my PhD. And also I'm nominated many times for, for some important position in Indonesia. And then at the, again, uh, I want to see also from community uh, level that once they, uh, we uh, provide alternative education in, instead of uh, um, formal education to the people, it means we open the opportunity, opportunity the same opportunity, even though per perhaps the, the different life. So I think education not only for important for ourselves, but also to, to the community. That's why I always... Uh, uh, keep encouraging myself to do that. Not only education for myself, develop my capacity, but also for the community I work with. And now, Caroline Krasagrang, I would like to hear uh, from you about the role of education and how important it is for you. I, I think I'm actually going to tell a story about my mother, which is kind of funny, because um, I'm sure you all have a lot of contacts with your mothers every day. So, you know, I had this career, and I thought it was so great, right? I was a lawyer. I was the deputy leader of a state with 8 million people. I get this job. My mother calls me up, and she's like, finally, I am so proud of you. And I'm like, what was with the other stuff? She's like, education is the only thing that can change the world. Um, and she's right, right? She's right. It is. It's the, the root of pretty much the answer to every question. And uh, so I'm just going to quote my mom on this one. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's the key to change the world, education. And I would like to hear from you also, Francisca. Okay. Um, for, I think for me, when, when we started, we, when we designed this uh, learning program that we called Calavio Coder Camp, and why we focus so much on, on uh, developing skills, uh, especially 21st century skills, that co collaborations, communication, uh, creativity, uh, and critical thinking. Yeah, those four C's are the most important things that will help you success, be successful in the 21st centuries. A lot of times, I think in our education system, especially everything is so knowledge-based. And a lot of those knowledge you can learn any, anytime, anywhere, once you have your Google, right? <laughs> you just Google everything. Um, but now, uh, so, so thinking, about, thinking ahead about the jobs that you're going to have in like five years, there's a lot of jobs that will disappear. There will be a lot of jobs that will appear <laughs> out of nowhere and then a lot of new careers. Uh, so those four skills, and then including uh, being able to adapt, uh, are those things that are not taught in our schools. So that's why uh, I urge you, um, yes, you are in schools right now. You are uh, studying whatever you're studying. I agree with, uh, with Mary about that. You have to 
take some things that you would no normally you wouldn't normally uh, take. Learn new things. Learning skills is one of the most important things. Also, to 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 unlearn the things that you don't need anymore. To learn new things and always be ready to explore something new because our education system doesn't uh, provide everything for you. And the world is changing right now as we speak. Everything is changing, and especially for women, uh, I think there's. Um, um, this is the most important time also for you to, to start looking into what is it that I want to do in the future. How are you going to contribute to the society? Um, uh, our culture really you know, put that glass ceiling on, uh, on, on us and, uh, on, uh, with a lot of expectations and the society, how they view us and everything. But then there are so many ways. Technology also provides you with so many ways on how you can contribute to become uh, leaders in the society. I, I, I learned that 69% of social entrepreneurs in Indonesia are women. So yes, we lead the change in Indonesia. We lead the social changes in Indonesia. So there's so many ways you can do that. Uh, go out and do research. <laughs> yes. Always challenge yourself. Thank you, Francisca. And now, how about you, um, Christina? Yeah. I think education is, plays a huge role in character development for, my, for myself personally. And my advice is if you're in school, take as little as possible all the classes that has to do with your hard skills and take more, there are more take more classes that are more focused on case studies, discussion, discussion-based classes, and more interaction with your classmates. Because the beauty of what I learned in, in Cornell was that, yes, you get the hard skills by reading your textbooks, your online PowerPoint, and the, and the lectures with, with your professors. But what you, what you can't get out of it is the connection and interaction with your classmates. Because your classmates, you, you never know who you're sitting next to, and they, they can provide huge value. Like, for example, one of my classmates is a venture capital firm. One, and then on the left is, is from a hotel company in the Philippines. So their opinions and their take on uh, uh, different uh, aspects of what the professor is teaching can be so different from the professor that it, it can give you a different point of view. So that's my advice on um, education. Thank you very much, Christina. And uh, as a closing statement, I would like to ask for your messages, hopes and wishes for women's leadership and education. Okay. I'll, 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 let me just say that I have a lot of um, respect for each one of you that's in the room. The fact that you came here, I would say that you're all leaders. Sometimes I would say that people think uh, there's a special point in time when you become a leader. Um, today, coming here to um, at America is all about leadership. You made a choice to come today to learn, to hear what we had to say. Um, so I applaud you for that. And for the men in the room, thank you for also joining because you're also leaders as well. Um, so just as a closing statement, never think that you're not a leader. Um, you have to believe in yourself. Um, everything you've probably heard today is all about um, putting your hand up, trying new things, not being afraid to fail. And um, I would just say that I strongly um, encourage you and I also have faith in you that um, you will all be successful. And uh, I remember speaking with someone, I'll just end with this. Uh, somebody said, you have to love yourself, and you have to look in the mirror and just say, I love myself, and feel good about yourself, because every decision you're making, every choice you make, is your choice, and it's a good choice. Thank you. And please, Rosita, give your message to all of us. Okay. Um, I just want to address this issue to all of us here, especially for the students. You, you should believe you are a leader already at least for yourself, okay? So believe that you can do something and can move forward and then, uh, and then get your dreams, okay? Believe in your dreams. That's I always say to my students, okay? If, if I'm your lecturer, can go to, yes, you should go far from me. I don't know where is it. But you should go and then be more international, open your minded, uh, I mean, uh, open your more space, not really satisfied with what you have achieved now. And then also, Believe that you can do more in your life and then to, to others. So share, share, and share to other people. Thank you so much. And Caroline Casagran, what are your messages, hopes, and wishes for women? Well, I, I think I covered a lot of them today. Um, and I really enjoyed speaking with all of you. Um, what a, what a good-looking group, right? <laughs> um, but thank you so much for coming out. Um, don't be afraid. 
I, I, I think one of the things that the Assistant Secretary was talking about that's such an inherently American quality is that we're not really afraid to fail. Because um, in America, if you fail, people are kind of like, that's okay, you can try again, right? Yeah. Um, and so never be afraid of that failure. Um, I think it, it leads to entrepreneurship, it leads to unbelievable success like we have on this stage. Um, and by the way, I loved your story about your classmates, Christina. That was so cool. Um, and also, I might add, your classmates in California, right? Great, great ad for Education USA. Um, but certainly, go out there, follow your dreams, do what you love, and you never work a day in your life. My dad told me that, and I didn't believe him, but now, now I've worked a long time, and I do. So follow, follow your passion. And Francisca, what are your hopes and wishes for women's leadership and also education? Yeah, I think, uh, well, first I want to repeat what Rosita said, that be your own leader first before you lead others. <laughs> that I think that's really, really important. And uh, starting from, uh, well, becoming your own leader is about knowing what you want, who you are, what your strengths and weaknesses are, so that you have a sense of ground uh, to stand on. You have uh, a sense of that you are centered that way. People believe you if you want to lead some, if you want to lead them somewhere. Yeah, so be, uh, you need to believe in yourself first before you make other people believe. And secondly, I think women leadership is not about men versus women. Yeah, it's about diversity. And everybody knows that the more uh, diverse there is uh, uh, in ideas, the better we are. So talk, uh, so again for the I guess for the guys here who came here I appreciate you came here and I hope that you also support the women in your lives in your environment uh, in your uh, community who wants to be leaders who have good ideas to encourage them to become leaders. Thank you, Francisca. And for Christina from a millennial to the millennials here, <laughs> what are your messages? I think for me, being a leader is having the audacity and persistence to chase after your dreams and find new ways of thinking and um, doing stuff. But also to never doubt yourself because there's always going to be somebody better, but they're not going to be you and you have your own way of thinking. Um, but the last thing about being a leader is uh, with you know, being um, very ambitious or entrepreneurial or being very uh, persistent and stuff like that, at the back of your mind, you have to also be um, equally responsible. Because when you create a new enterprise, you're not only thinking about your life, you're thinking about your co-founder's life, your team's life, and the well-being of your employees as well. So you have to be uh, responsible as well. Thanks. Whoa, amazing. Please give a big round of applause for all the panelists. And now we are going to take your questions, but first we would like to answer uh, the questions that comes from our social media accounts. Yoga has it. Can I have it? Yoga? Okay. Thank you. And for all the guests here, you may also ask questions. Uh, for the first round, we are going to take three questions. The girl here and then over there. And then, uh, okay, this one. One, yeah. White t-shirt and over there. The girl in the sweater. And then the girl here with the yellow jacket. Okay, one man. <laughs> yeah, so we have four questions. Okay, yes, you can start. Please mention your name and uh, the university you are from. Okay, thank you for this outstanding opportunity. First of all, I would like to express my gratitude to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia um, and at America for giving me this precious chance to attend this discussion. And I would like to give a huge appreciation for all these outstanding and amazing women on stage. All of you are truly inspiring. Let us give them a huge applause. So, my name is Maria. I'm 20 years old from Maumere, Flores, East Nusa Tenggara Timur Province. As a student in public administration and public policy, I focus a lot on politics. And the topic we're talking about today is related to my field of study and interest. Talking about leadership, I would like to ask the Excellency Assistant Secretary for Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs and the Excellency Deputy Assistant Secretary. What opportunities are there for immigrant women in U.S. politics? Are there barriers to immigrant women becoming bureaucrats or running for office in the United States of America? Thank you. Oh, 
Alright. Thank you uh, for all of your guys' speech, which has really motivated us. Uh, I'm here, uh, I want to introduce myself. I am Julie from Institute of Social and Political Science. So my question is, actually I'm on my beginning as a leader in one kind of organizations in my institute. Uh, my question is, how do I have to do to build the great leadership with my team? Uh, while we have a very different emotionality, mindset, and you know, uh, then how do I have to do to gain my people trust uh, that I am qualified enough as a leader while well, this is the first time for me to lead uh, any organization? Thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, I'm Sasti from University of Indonesia, and I would like to, uh, I would like to ask uh, Miss Mary Royce and Miss Caroline about uh, what do you think about tokenism in women empowerment movement? Uh, in Indonesia, we call it uh, yang penting ada. Uh, it means uh, women empowerment become a gimmick uh, where uh, people would think that if there's a quantity of women, women in uh, an institution, then that institution must be uh, encourage uh, women to uh, being a leader. Uh, but I think women empowerment is not that uh, shallow. It's more deeper than quantity. Uh, what do you think about that? And second of all, I would like to ask all of the uh, all of uh, you all uh, about what do you think about uh, the future of women in STEM, STEM, uh, science, technology engineering and medical uh, and medics uh, because uh, we all know that people uh, most of people think that uh, those four areas are is a man's world and what do you think about women's future in that field thank you thank you so much and for it the guy here okay okay thank you very much the decision of you make me brighter things about the women. also i a uh, man i also have the curiosity about the women's empowerment em and now, I have an NGO too. This name, Brewery, or Bank Runta Indonesia, or Indonesia was Recycle Bank, that focusing to purpose to empower the women in my village. The focusing of these programs to focus the mother around of my village. The program is starting clearly in one month, but after that, the participation is lacking from the 50 people and now just 10 people. The question is, I want to ask about how your tips or how your suggestions to make this brewery as a long-term program that can lift the family quality and also the woman quality around of my village. Thank you. What's your name again? Judo Bravo. You go. Judo. Judo. Yeah, okay. Bravo. So I'm going to read the question from our Instagram from Aniskariskia7 and the question is how to increase the life skill program for young women who live in rural areas and do not have access to proper education uh, yeah we can like sh discuss this and then for those who want to add just feel free to add okay. I'm going to start with you is it the last for the question here yes okay. how to increase the life skill well, program for okay. those who live in rural areas all right well one of the things I mentioned earlier was that I um, worked in technology. And, one of, and what I really worked hard to do is what we call bringing broadband technology so people could get on the internet. The exciting part today is that people, if they can get on the internet, they can also improve their opportunities for education uh, where they can actually uh, see the world through the internet. I was just uh, talking with someone in my office he went to Uzbekistan and a woman said the internet is my sea isn't that interesting here the country of Uzbekistan is landlocked but she sees the fact that she has access to the entire world through the internet and I think that's one of the great things so even if you're in a rural area if you have access I think you can still learn and there are a lot of things that are online today uh, also you can do communities uh, where you stay connected and then lastly, um, before the internet, there was books. Uh, so I was thinking about that. I've heard from talking with Indonesians, a lot of 
real interest again in books, which is very exciting. I learned about going away and work, going international. I wanted to see the world, and I read about the world through reading books. So I think that's really powerful. And I think there's probably every topic that you can learn. We even have one of our presidents that never went to college, but every day I heard that he read a different book to learn a new skill. So I think that's really important, and you can certainly do that as a woman in the rural area. Books and internet, who wish to add? Okay, I just want to share with my experience. Actually, uh, the, the community I work with is far from Indramayu. It's very remote uh, village, it's called Bondan. Uh, I think the, the most important thing when you have a program, you should come to the community, right? It's because the sense of relationship, you, you build your trust, and then they know they can do something. It's not from uh, you should meet them. So that's why I always uh, I wrote an article in a newspaper and some uh, an article uh, in, in journals that the program should be implemented in the community, not in the hotel. Okay, not in the hotel. You should come to the community. Also, like uh, uh, like assistant secretary say, now we have technology. Everybody have uh, a handphone. They can uh, rather than they upload their status in Facebook, they can share the, the life skill they already developed. So I think this is like a develop awareness to the people, social responsibility, another thing. So yeah, that's I think the strategy. And others want to add? Yeah, I think about the uh, the issue about um, developing um, life skills for young girls in the rural areas um, with the help of technology was uh, certainly um, uh, leverage the, the possibility of them getting those uh, skills. And also I think um, I, for the community to realize that you don't have to be uh, centered or, or depending, uh, you know, depending themselves on um, national curriculum. You know, because I, I think a lot of the issues in education in Indonesia, because we're so we're such a big country, and then a lot of the areas are are, are you know far uh, from you know being able to reach the, the the standard of the national curriculum. But I think if they look into themselves, they have a lot of um, local wisdom that they can actually um, cultivate and make that into um, a way of empowering their own. Uh, community members. Thank you, Francisca. And for the next question, we would like to answer the question from Maria uh, from Maumere. And then uh, she asked about opportunities for immigrant women and the barriers in the United States. Okay. This is specific specifically for you and also for Caroline Casagrone. All right. Well, what I will say is for legal immigrant women, there are certainly many, many opportunities. Um, and I would also add, I was thinking about politics since I'm from Southern California. I got involved uh, and was interested since I was 18, 19, getting involved in campaigns. We have many women that um, became citizens in the United States or from different countries. One uh, was an elected official from Korea. Another one was uh, from Taiwan. She's a state senator in, in this uh, state legislature. Even our Secretary of State, um, Elaine Chow, she uh, is originally from Taiwan. Um, so that's just an example of politics where uh, someone like the um, Secretary Chow came here um, and uh, was, uh, her family legally immigrated to the United States. And we also have many immigrants that are, do the same in the area of business, for example. Um, so they become citizens and they contribute. For example, um, in the Silicon Valley, I went to an event when uh, Prime Minister Modi spoke there were 10 top uh, executives from major companies. The CEO or the chairman or president was six out of the 10 were from India. So they were Indian Americans. So you can see that as an example, many people are contributing uh, in different fields and they're either, um, in, for example, business, universities, government, and of course there are many, many women contributors. And how about you? Sure. Well. Uh Generally speaking, women are about 20% of any American legislature. So we're only about one in five, which is surprising to most people. You probably think we have more representation than that. We don't. Um, but immigrant women in particular, I served with a lot of immigrant women in New Jersey that were senators and assembly women. Um, here's the secret to getting elected as an immigrant woman. Um, from, from an election standpoint, 
find where the biggest Indonesian diaspora is in the United States, and there's your district. So uh, you'll have the best time fundraising. I'm sure you'll have great block captains and plenty of campaign volunteers. Um, so yes, absolutely, but you got to pick your area and then pick a party. Really doesn't matter which one. Um, one of the interesting parts of, of American politics is people think, you know, one party, the other party. I can say uh, with authority, having spent a long time working among people of both parties, that there are plenty of good and plenty of bad people in both parties. Plenty of smart people and plenty of stupid people in both parties. <laughs> So just you gotta you gotta pick your party, figure out who kind of aligns with you, and uh, and pick your pick your location. That's the most important part. And now the second uh, the, the second question is about uh, for a first time leader how to gain trust, how to uh, make make people believe that we are qualified enough and how about to build great leadership with the team? Okay, well, so uh, we were talking about what we went to school to study, uh, but I didn't share too much about my fact that I went back and got my MBA. Um, and one of the things that we did, as Christina had mentioned, was a lot of case studies. Uh, what happened in the case studies is they actually teach you a lot about going around and listening to people I mentioned that earlier, and, and instead of trying to make a decision right away, to learn really what's happening and all the facts of, um, and, and um, the plan. Uh, so I think that adds a lot of credibility when you go around, especially if you're new going into a company. And for example, I'm new at the US Department of State. I started last April, so I can't say that I know everything. Um, one of the ways I learn is by traveling. I learned quite a bit today by coming to Ad America. I had never seen this before. Um, it's hard to imagine what it's like back, being back in Washington, D.C., and now I've seen it with my own eyes. So what the most important things is to do, to go out there and talk to people, learn, and see it with your own eyes. I think also, uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, is actually to try uh, to do things, um, th those skills yourself. Uh, you know. I think if a person just talks about doing something but never does it themselves, I think it's less credibility. Um, and I also think a person shouldn't be um, not, how do I say this, you should be willing to uh, help out the team. Um, and I'm also a big strong believer in training. Um, for example, uh, one of the things that you do in my job is, and you're, you're in the press, we have press training. So I can take training to learn how to talk to the press. So I've had a few training classes. So instead of being afraid, I would take these classes to get feedback and learn more to how to do it. So I think no matter what your area is, I think you should be willing to learn and to listen. Okay, I would like to uh, hear from Christina as a young leader as well. Maybe you have something to share with our guest here, Julie. Yeah, sure. I'm also a young leader because I only have uh, one year of work experience compared to uh, my other co-founders. So I guess my advice is um, come with it, come with um, problems with a lot of bravery and don't be afraid to fail because through the failures is when you learn the fastest. Like for example, last time um, Traveler was actually um, founded by four co-founders, um, but it, there was a disagreement with one of the co-founders and he was the CFO, the oldest, the most experienced, and he worked in you know, big, much bigger firms than all of us, and he was the one fundraising. But he wasn't successful in fundraising, and then we we're all going to go bankrupt. And um, so I decided to step up with only one year of experience and no background in investment banking or finance whatsoever. So I just decided to, to pitch. I got rejected by probably 22 venture capitals, but I just kept going until one said yes, and it was enough to convince other people to join the round. So just be brave and um, learn from your failures and learn quickly. <laughs> Don't repeat the same mistakes. <laughs> And you have something else to add? I just want to add one more thing. Uh, since I became the assistant secretary, and of course I did, never did it before, I was appointed by the president, and I, what I did was I actually went and met with the five people that were assistant secretaries before me. Um, all of them were women, by the way. Um, I would meet 
uh, each one for about four or five hours. One woman I had lunch with, the other woman I had breakfast with, and I talked to them about, all about the position. Uh, so it helped me tremendously, and I still stay in touch with them. Um, they were Democrats and Republicans, and they all publicly endorsed me. And I think that's really important to ask for their support and also to learn from people that have done the position before. So, um, in fact, a few times I've had uh, gone out and asked them on the phone or given them, uh, you know, had a question, and it's been very, very helpful to me. So, willingness to learn and also listening to people in the team. That helps. And then for the next questions, uh, in Indonesia especially, Sasi, who asked this question, like uh, we heard uh, so often that as long as we have women representation, that's enough. So when we talk about leadership, about empowerment, uh, we tend to simplify it into numbers, like quantitative, as long as we have like 10% of women, that's enough, or 20% of women, that's enough. What do you think about this? I would like to start from you. Are we starting to say again? Yes. So you think, what, what do I think about the numbers? About, uh, about the tendency of us to simplify when we talk about women empowerment and women leadership, as long as we have women representation, that's enough, and not to talk or to focus more on the quality oh, or well, other aspect well, that's of That's a good point to talk about the quality. Empowerment, yeah. I, I think that's uh, the quality is in very important, but I, I also want to add to the group is that I think that we also need to get more women uh, trying um, new things, whether it's a new going out to run for politics or women trying out for business. The reason I say that, for example, in politics, sometimes I'll see a, um, a race for uh, people running for office and there'll be 10 candidates and for example, there might be one or two women, and there'll be eight men. Or I, I go to an event with entrepreneurs. I was just at a giant event with entrepreneurs, and I see oftentimes more men than women. So the reason I say that is, I think we just get, need to get women out there. They need to be the statistics. I mean, obviously, can you imagine for every race, if we had 20 people running, and if, let's say, 17 were women? How many more women would be elected, just statistically? Or every time a business was, uh, people were going to the venture capitalists like Christina was talking about, that these are all women-owned businesses that were going to those venture capitalists? I would, I would imagine that statistically, there's just not as many. So I would say it's very important, the quality, but I also think the quantity. I'd like to see more people risking and, and trying and, and um, trying to put themselves out there. And uh, Caroline Casagrande, I would like to hear from you how to encourage women's participation. So we're not only like having women uh, representing us as only to fulfill the quota, yeah. but much more than that. Right. Well, it's a great question. What, what does it matter, right? What does it matter if there's 10 women in a legislature or 20 or 30? The reason it matters is because you work on what you know. So I was uh, pregnant for two of my terms, which was great. Um, but you have to think if there, were, uh, if there were a role reversal in the carrying of children, how would our laws look differently for things like paid family leave, right? For going in and out of your job while you try to have your family. Um, and so to have those voices at the table means the conversation changes a little bit, right? And if you're not there, as we learned earlier, you're on the menu, um, and no one's talking about no one's talking about your issues. So that's why it's important. It's important because your issues will not be brought to the forefront if you're not there as part of the conversation. And also, again, if no one asks every woman in this room to run for office someday, I am personally asking you all to run for office someday, and I hope to come back to Indonesia and uh, meet you in your future roles. And Sassi also asked about uh, the future of STEM and women. I would like uh, Francisca to ask these questions. Yeah, I think there's, uh, we're getting, are, are you majoring in engineering or STEM? What's your major in? Uh, in communication major. A communication major, okay, good. Um, so yeah, I think in STEM, there's more and more interest uh, nowadays. Uh, we have, uh, Society of Women Engineers have a Jakarta chapter over here. So. 
uh, any of the girls here who wants to get involved with them, they have a lot of activities the, that promotes them to uh, young girls and women uh, in all f in all STEM fields. Um, but I, uh, from 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 a technology point of view, um, there's still a lot more boys. Too many boys <laughs> in my classes compared to girls, and I still think that why is it like that? Yeah, I think I think um, a lot of times the uh, in our generations in the parents' generation right now, there's still, uh, there, there, there's still this view that, oh, technology or STEM is for boys. Yeah, uh, we still have that. So we need more uh, female role models in those fields. Uh, you don't have to be majoring in engineering or in STEM, but then the fact that you are able to uh, use technology to use STEM to uh, and, and show that hey I, I I know I know how to use this for uh, to empower me to make my life better to make my work better to make my studies better being able to do that I think that's also that's that's already a plus a lot of the businesses are being able uh, a lot of women's businesses are being empowered by this by being leveraged by technology so being able to uh, to use that is also uh, you can you can be role models to to young girls yeah. Um, and also another thing is um, the I also see a lot more girls I you know I, I recruit from a lot of SMKs uh, uh, in uh, software engineering so a lot of my coaches uh, we call them coaches a lot of my uh, teachers uh, um, are SMK graduates from vocational schools majoring in uh, software engineering. And I found a lot of girls, there are more and more girls in those majors. However, when I interview them, they're really smart girls, they pass the test and everything. But then when I ask them, when I start interviewing them, I, I found that they what they're lacking is uh, the, their, their ambition of what they want to do. So the knowledge is there, the skill is there. However, the, the courage is not there. The courage to do something about what they already know, the courage to do something about, uh, uh, with their, to use their skills, to dream ahead, to know what you want to, what they want to do in in the next five years, besides getting married, <laughs> I guess, <laughs> it's not is not there. So the, so so that's what I what I want to encourage young girls. Um, instead of uh, don't stop in studying or get into STEM when you when you go to when you go to university when you go to school but then also dream about what you want to do in those fields so i think that's really important thank you francisca and for the last question we have question from judo uh, so he runs an ngo working uh, with community development and also uh, he has this rural bank in a village i think rosita tandos uh, can yeah. answer how he can uh, run the rural bank better because uh, the number of uh, yeah, the the member is decreasing, right? right? Yes. Yeah, it's a very important issue in doing community development. Actually, how to uh, interact people each other. So uh, I, um, as far as I run the program, community economic empowerment. Uh, the enthusiast, the enthusiastic of the uh, the participant, uh, or, or not decline. Why? Be because we run the program in open space. Like I say, everybody can welcome. We raise the the very loud voice when doing presentations. So everybody, and then we run also music before we start the program. So they will, oh, what happened there? And then they come and join, and at least they can stop by and get inspired or they can get be motivated. So this is one of the strategy. So that's why the, my, the program is, I, 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 always, uh, I mean, already uh, uh, sustained until now. And also don't limit the woman when they want to come with their children or their husband, then allow them to go, okay? So if I uh, uh, provide consumption like a cake or lunch for 70%, uh, I should provide more than that, double, because they will bring their children. Because sometimes women cannot go because they, they think about their children at home, like, uh, right? <laughs> you, they think about their husband. So while we run the program, the husband is there, also listens. So it's to help the women to, get, to, to, to keep in the program. If their husband also join and the children also say, oh, oh that's the next round, uh, Ms. Rosita will come from Jakarta again with all of us and run the program. So I think that's a, a, one a strategy that I can share with you. And then a, the, another thing is to build trust. Yeah. 
At the first time I come to this village, they thought I am an agent to recruit the woman to go overseas for work. <laughs> yeah, they thought, oh, that's a new agent. And then they see, and I, and I say, no, this is not a new agent. I, and then we, we should prove that this is uh, beneficial for them. Yeah. We know them, we not uh, work with them for, the, for, for, for ourselves. So this program is for you. It will sustain with your own. And now I can prove, even though I'm in Jakarta, and they're from very rural area in Ramayu, the program still continues with, without new funding. So they run the program, but they consult with me. So let the community to run the program and the, own your program. Thank you. So very interesting discussion. I wish we could have more time to take your questions, but we ran out of time. And please, big round of applause for all of us here. Woo! And now I would like to give it back to Dina from Ad America. Can we have another round of applause, please, for our wonderful speaker today? And I would like also to recognize the Indonesia USA 70th Youth Ambassadors from Kemlu. They come from all over Indonesia. Give them a round of applause. And also Pak Aziz Nurwahyudi, representative from Kementerian Luar Negeri. And now I would like to invite every speaker to uh, join us for a photo session. And for everybody, please be seated. We, we, we would like to take pictures with all of you also. Okay, can everybody join? Okay, another round of applause please for our wonderful speaker today. Okay, everybody smiles. Everybody will be included in this picture. So smile, everybody. Okay, one, two, three. One more time. Thank you everybody for joining us today.